uh, let's tell me if you can see me live now i'm live i guess ha ab dekhen Hi, just testing if you guys can hear me loud and clear. so thanks a lot for joining uh, i'm just waiting for our moderator to tell me when we can start and then we'll start it Uh, sorry for uh, losing some time over it uh, because of the technical difficulties. Uh, uh, David, I'm getting confirmation from other guys that they are able to hear me. So, yeah. So give us a minute and uh, let us uh, let all the participants to join. Uh, shouldn't take more than a minute, and then uh, my moderator will probably start the session, and I'll take over. Okay, folks. Uh, I got the go ahead from my moderator. Uh, thanks a lot for joining the session. I would try to make it as engaging as possible. Uh, sorry for losing uh, some time over the technical difficulties, but I really appreciate that you guys have joined. Uh, my name is Imran Zaman. Uh, right now, I'm working as uh, uh, an AVP of Cybersecurity Engineering in one of uh, banks in New York City. Uh, so, by virtue of my uh, nature of job uh, uh it has been a fun experience so far uh where we are experiencing a lot of cybersecurity happenings 
uh, and working hard and praying to fall on the right side of it. Uh, so in this in this very presentation, uh, I, I I know that now we have lost some time, so I'll try to make it a little quick. And initially, the idea was to discuss more in depth on the problems with cloud and more with the problems with uh, big data uh, problems in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, but you might have heard yesterday and or day before yesterday, there is a, a kind of a hack that happened in Pakistan that was for K Electric. Uh, the news is in kind of a public domain right now, but not much of the information is available. So uh, I was I happened to get some insight and information, uh, how it happened, what may have gone wrong, uh, and some technical analysis of the potential malware that may have done the damages. So I thought that this would be more interesting for you folks to look into that uh, as the malware that is uh, used in this, this very compromise is NetWalker. Uh, this has created a lot of havoc in the recent past, so I thought it's a good time to discuss it. Uh, so I, I'll quickly be discussing on the cloud and big data risk, and I, I cut the slide short, and I'll delve straight into the uh, K-Electric hack. So, so uh, I have been working with big data and cloud. Uh, big data is kind of a buzzword. Cloud is not a buzzword anymore. Uh, cloud is, I, I would say, rather omnipresent, whether SaaS, PaaS, IaaS, and they all offer different kind of services to you. And thus, by the nature of uh, services they are offering you, uh, they are uh, subject to different kind of risks and attacks. Similarly, in, in, in the big data, yes, I know we always talk about velocity of big data, volume of big data, and, and what big data can do for us. It's, it's always very exciting to think about that, that, hey, if I have, so so just for the people who do not know what is big data, I'll just quickly say that big data is the data that is big. So what is actually big? Uh, is big means the size of the data? Does big means uh, the heterogeneous nature of the data? Does big means the frequency with which the data is generated? Does big means that it is a relation, uh, it's, it's a kind of a combination of different formats, types of data from different devices, from different region? The answer is all of them. So it's very easy to get excited about the big data because in the world where we are uh, fast moving and we are heavily relying on, on the data insights to develop our business strategies, I have seen companies uh, during my stint in the cybersecurity that, that, that companies have a tendency to uh, collect all the data. Like they want everything in their environment. Okay, good for you. You got all the data in your environment. But now, do you know that you have to handle this data? You have to archive it. You have to process it. You have to parse it. You have to index it. This all requires a heck lot of resources. All right, till the data is in your production or in your processing, you take care of the data. But what after that? how you archive it, how you put it in the offline storage. This is where things get murky. This is where the controls get weak. And since you have collected so much data, you do not know what is within the intertwined layers of this data. Is there a PII inside that? Is there any critical information in that? Do you really need all of that? Or you just collected them in the haste? I have seen a lot of data breaches just because the company do not have the tendency or the capacity to uh, uh, handle this kind of uh, this kind of magnanimous data, so this is one where big data has a problem. So I would say, if you are going into the field of big data, please do consider security concerns as well. Now talk about the cloud. Everybody talks about cloud, and people say, "Hey, cloud has itself a very good security deterrence." but we have seen cloud being a security chicken as well. We have seen ch chinks in their arms. Uh, we have seen them being subjected to DDoS. Okay, someone would come and say, no, we have seen clouds deploying CDNs or cloud 
controls that that actually deviates this kind of uh, DDoS attacks. But still, it's one cloud. People know that. And if your cloud do not have adequate controls, I'm not talking about maybe Google Cloud, maybe not talking about AWS Cloud, but, but the smaller clouds, they are subject to these problems. And then what you do with the access controls, because you know, you, you get a couple of keys and few controls through which you access your whole environment in the cloud. What if your that key got compromised? You lost everything. You lost the control. You lost the data. You lost your infrastructure. You kind of wash out your company. And, and this is not a theory only. You have seen this happening in LinkedIn. You have seen this in happening in Microsoft, I guess 2014, Yahoo. And these are the big companies and we have seen them going down because of the cloud. Uh, a, a recent incident is Wise Labs where they lost around 2.4 million of customer data uh, because of the security, uh, because of some breach. So we see it's, it's good to adopt all these technologies, but be very careful about what controls are required. So, so this is this. I, I was initially planning to discuss more on that, but uh, uh, I, because of the change of the events in a couple of days, I, I thought to give it a twist. And so I'll just quickly discuss what are the constantly evolving threats landscapes. Uh, this actually applies to the big data and cloud as well. And then I'll delve into this hack that happened. So uh, if you see that this whole threat landscape is constantly evolving. Uh, when I say constantly evolving, what does it mean? Uh, we always say advent of new technologies, one thing. We always see advent of new protocols and people are kind of hasty in adopting new protocols for performance gains. And we have seen companies launching their products in the market that are kind of half baked. Why they're half baked? Because they are in kind of a race to reach to the market at earliest at possible to take the first mover's advantage. Uh, this is a good strategy from the business perspective, but maybe a bad strategy because then you get lesser time for your security testing. You get a you get lesser thought towards securing your tool rather because now you're focusing on enriching the feature and get reaching to the market. The third thing that is a problem is uh, the fourth thing or rather is a problem is uh, not every uh, product maker, not every uh, solution developer is baking in the security, but they are kind of bolting on the security. So like they create a tool, they create a solution, they, they launch in the market uh, with little thought into the design phase about security. And then they thought, okay, I'll, I'll release patches. We always release patches. This makes your software sluggish. This makes your product uh, lose the performance. And in the end, you are actually forced to strip those security controls and security layers. So uh, having said that, uh, we have been seeing uh, these issues that are not being addressed are uh, uh, had or are compromised by the uh, attackers. And, and remember one more thing, the attackers are no more the script kiddies. They are no more the developers. They are no more only programmers. They are kind of a very developed, matured uh, cyber criminal syndicates uh, that we saw in the case of uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, central bank hack that happened a few years ago, uh, not very in distant past, where we saw that uh, there was a whole methodology deployed to compromise the SWIFT network, uh, make the SWIFT transactions across the country, actually across the continent, make the encashments. Uh, so, so, so threat actors are getting mature with every going day. And then we say zero day exploits, uh, you, you cannot really do anything with that. No matter how good your tool is, uh, zero day exploits are always there. Uh, and to control that, the only thing is that you do the patch the human. You, you do not make mistakes while using those tools. And we will talk about that later. And one more thing that we are seeing in, in those recent times are that malwares have the ability to change their genetic makeup. They are polymorphic, they are metamorphic. They keep changing faces. Uh, we have seen crypto wall, 
uh, storm worm, emotet uh, trojan, and other trojans who have this ability to transform their code on the go. This is to evade that signature-based uh, AV detection or anti-malware detection. And, and this is kind of a very successful uh, anti-AV AV evasion technique or uh, anti-forensics technique. Then we are seeing a whole uh, sleuth of uh, multi-modular, multi-partite malwares, where we see that first a dropper comes in and uh, it's, it's kind of a benign tool. It sits in your environment, tries to read it, tries to connect to the data, uh, to, to an external resource, download more partites, download more more modules that are specific cut to need of your environment. Uh, they see what kind of environment it is, what kind of uh, uh, controls you have, detection controls or monitoring controls or prevention controls. And the new modules that are downloaded uh, have this, it makes this capability to evade all these things. So, so malware development techniques are really getting uh, matured. And then plain old overlooks that we will talk in the case of uh, 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 in the case of a so K electric hack, we'll see that uh, though the malware we are talking is polymorphic, though the malware is multimodular, no, no, this one is not multimodular, but the hack or compromise actually happened because of the plain old overlooks, because you had the security control, but they were either misconfigured or they had, uh, uh, or they were not properly being used. Uh, and then we'll see what could have gone wrong and. Uh, whatever intel I collected uh, talking to the people in the last couple of days. So let's talk about the K-Electric hack, what actually happened, and I'll give you a, a little uh, profile of the K-Electric. Uh, K-Electric is actually a sole uh, uh, electricity energy provider of uh, one of the largest city of Pakistan, Karachi. It has 2.5 million plus customers, uh, thousands of employees, so a fairly big company. Uh, the hack has supposedly happened on September 7th. Uh, it was in morning around 10 a.m. when a script goes off, uh, encrypted all the uh, devices, all the Windows servers. So uh, uh, if you go to the K-Electric website, you will see that their online services are not available. Uh, what my intel has told me, it seems like that uh, all the Windows-based machines, all the Windows-based servers, be it in production, be it in DR, are being encrypted by the ransomware. And I'll, and I'll tell you, uh, this ransomware networker has a very interesting twist because we have seen malwares like, uh, 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 sorry, ransomwares like Crypto Walker, a uh, Crypto Wall, and Crypto Lockers. But this has an interesting twist. Uh, this this malware is actually demanding. Uh, I'll show you the uh, the page, the landing page. Uh, a three around 3.8 million USD, and they have given I think four or five days, or I'm not sure six days. If it, the amount is not paid, uh, it, the, the price will go up. And 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 if you see what is the interesting thing, uh, Crypto Locker is uh, sorry, uh, Networker has actually amassed quite a good amount of wealth in the last few year, a few months. Uh, they first came in, I guess. Uh, August, but since March uptick, they have collected around $29 million in ransom. Uh, and this is not the first time we are seeing uh, uh, this uh, networker in action. We have seen it in University of California, uh, San Francisco. Uh, we have seen it in the leading uh, 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 law firms that are this law firm, uh, Kowan Leibovich Latman is very famous for his intellectual property. Uh, intellectual property uh, cases. Uh, and we have seen it uh, working networker in Argentina. We have seen it working in US and other regions. Uh, the payment uh, is asked to be through uh, BTC uh, Bitcoins. So if you go to, uh, so, so uh, this is the screenshot of uh, uh, networker Malware. So what happened is that a networker ransomware actually encrypted all the devices and just gave you one landing page or one uh, ransomware note 
And if you see the ransomware notes, some, some part is grayed out uh, because this is a confidential information. You see they have given six uh, six days. The screenshot I think I was taken was on uh, 7th of September. Uh, they are demanding uh, 30, 382 Bitcoins, roughly $3.8 million. Um, they provide actually a Bitcoin address. Uh, and in my analysis, I'll show you uh, if you backtrack Bitcoin address, you, uh, you, you'll see who it belongs to. And, uh, and this is quite interesting that if you on the top, you see, you'll see a different tab, uh, buttons and you'll see a button of chat. So this is a tech support of this uh, ransomware. So they are providing your tech support as well, uh, just in case you wanted to pay and you have any difficulty, uh, they, they can, they can actually guide you through how to get the decryptor, how, how to make the payment, how to get the decryptor and how to get your data back. So this this is this is from the screenshot of the K Electric uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, uh, and that uh, I will do a quick analysis of uh, Networker malware. But before I'll tell you that Networker first uh, I guess arised in uh, some around August 2019. Uh, we saw first in infections around September 2019, and it was infecting a few devices uh, and it was quite successful. But in March, 2020, it was kind of a rise when we saw a rise in uh, Corona pandemic in US, we saw the whole rebirth of this networker malware. And what was that re rebirth? So I was reading through some of the uh, underground foras where one of uh, a very a uh, respected kind of uh, cyber criminal Bugatti was talking about hiring some more criminals, cyber criminals, uh, who would actually uh, help them to reincarnate uh, this malware. And uh, it was in March 2020 when they very aggressively started this uh, advertisement of Networker as a RAS, ransomware as a service. So, so it is not just a one-off incident, but they, you can go, like anyone can go contact uh, uh, they, they, this uh, uh, networker makers, or Bugatti, or they, they are, uh, they, their team is called Spider. Uh, they're Russian-based hackers, and you can actually use their platform to infect something. Uh, there's a whole protocol around that. You need to talk to our services to do that. So, so this is about the networker, and yeah, I, I was talking about a one interesting twist what they have done. Uh, if you guys have an idea what ransomwares like CryptoWalker or CryptoLocker were doing, they they came into your system, they comes into your system, and they they encrypt your files. Good enough, right? Uh, and then you can choose, hey, I do not want to pay it, or do I want to pay it? If you have backup available, and if you think that yeah, it's not very critical for me, I can still restore my things. You can you can avoid paying it. But what they are doing, they are kind of doing a two-pronged attack. What is a two-pronged attack? The one is the plain old ransomware thing, where when they are coming into your system and encrypting your files, okay? So you have now loss of availability. Maybe you can survive that, but the second prong comes in and they have a page called uh, a Networker Page of Shame, where they actually uh, post the screenshots of your data your uh, exchange server emails and all and actually threatens you that we have actually f so so first they stole your data and then encrypted it so they have a copy of your critical data and they said that it's not only about losing the data but what will happen to your reputation if we start releasing the data uh, on in the market so depending upon what kind of data it is if it is a financial book information if it is about exchange server uh, data like the emails that you do not want to go out. This is really a kind of a strong holding um, the company to pay them. And that's why, as I said you earlier, I told you earlier that since uh, last five months, since uh, March 2020, since they have changed their strategy, they have amassed $29 million plus dollars in the ransom. So uh, just to do the technical analysis of this networker, uh, uh, the networker actually it was named as mail2, but if you do more analysis, you will see that the uh, developers of this malware are calling it as a networker. 
Uh, generally, uh, the name of the executable file is uh, QESW or WTV converter, a kind of a file names that you generally see in your taskbars. Uh, encryption is SALSA 20. SALSA 20 is, uh, is called to have a very good uh, it's called to have a very good entropy level. Uh, the ransom node, uh, where the screenshot you saw earlier, is part of notepad.exe. It's not notepad, it's notepad.exe. Uh, the file size is around 70 KB to so 94 KB, so very small file. It has, uh, uh, the, uh, it has the encryption uh, algo and encryption key uh, encoded into it. Uh, the file size, uh, the, the file type is uh, a PE32. And if you see uh, the properties of this file, you will see that they have obfuscated the file as Microsoft Corporation, though you will see there is no signature from that. But this is a very nice nifty technique to make investigator a fool during a triage process. Uh, earlier to uh, March 2020, they were using couple of email addresses to get contacted by the victims. But after 2 March 2020, they changed their strategy. And now they have provided you two TOR addresses. Uh, uh, this is actually a link to their uh, the, to their page. Uh, uh, you need to use uh, TOR Onion for that. Uh, and this is how you got get contacted with them. So this is a one significant change how victims are contacting them. Um, uh, and very interestingly, these last three lines, if you see, I'll explain what it do is that when it comes into your, so uh, the modus operandi of uh, this malware is uh, two methods. One is the most important, if you see in the top here, you see it is either exploit on the diagram, uh, either it's from the compromised accounts or either from the spear phishing. Uh, in COVID, uh, uh, during the, this COVID time, we know people are panicked. Uh, anything that is related to the COVID-19 information, COVID-19 uh, documentation or, or some information about that, people are kind of think that they have to click the link. And this is how what the spear phishing do. It actually makes a content very, uh, uh, very much uh, uh, likable for you that you go into the content. So spear phishing is the first thing that they download a VBS script. This VBS script uh, is the first infection that comes into your environment. Once the infection is in your environment, uh, so, so the VBS script comes in, it uses uh, Microsoft Office as a host to get the script executed. Uh, if you know, WS script.exe is actually used. And uh, once the script has been executed, it creates a few processes and it also creates one more executable. This executable is then used to uh, spread the infection. So the VBS is the first file that is downloaded from the spear phishing email. Once it gets executed through WS script, you get uh, executable PE32 and then it goes uh, into the spreading of infection on the computers that are connected. It, it infects only Windows hosts. Uh, so now once it do, it do a very interesting thing. It creates a registry. This is for the persistence. I'll talk about that later, uh, but it do three more things. It has an unlocker, uh, unlocker, a parameter in its in its configuration and this unlocker actually it says that do not encrypt anything that is related to VMware related to Windows Defender that's the Windows firewall or media player interestingly why it is not uh, encrypting them because if you encrypt either of them like if you encrypt Windows Defender the chances are your Windows would fail so your windows would not come up again so they do not want your operating system to fail they want it to be running they just want the data to be encrypted why they want it to be running so that they can contact you or you can or, or you can see that really that data has been encrypted so this is these are the softwares they do not in, uh, uh, unlock uh, there can be more of them that they may uh, they may choose not to unlock then there are some unlocker extensions like exes, MSIs, PS1, command, 
you, if whoever has an idea of the Windows platform would understand that XE and MSIs are very important executables and DLLs as well. If they are not available, probably your system will crash. So they are not encrypting them as well. And what they do, they kill WordPad, Outlook, Excel, Oracle, all these tools, why they kill them. So if you are, you, so say, the, the malware or ransomware comes into your system and starts executing and you are using Microsoft Office, like say Word, it will terminate Word because this may cause a conflict of uh, on, the, on a particular file or resource because Word is already using it and the malware wants to encrypt it. So what it do, it kills the Microsoft soft, uh, Office or Excel or Outlook so that the resource get released and it encrypts it. So this is how it do. And then one very fine thing it do is that there is a volume shadow in Windows that you can use to get some metadata or something restored back. It deletes a, a, a volume shadow as well. So, uh, and how it do, it creates a VSS admin uh, uh, executable I'll show you later. So, so it is making sure that not only a system is encrypted, there is no way to restore it. And once the data has been leaked, uh, you have to contact their uh, uh, the, the attackers through Tor uh, website. And this was a network walker profile that I already discussed. Uh, and just one more thing I wanted to tell you in that, uh, uh, it, it is actually uh, uh, compromising a lot of uh, a lot of industries like healthcare, uh, education industries, private companies, and uh, I would say uh, some government agencies as well. We have seen this uh, impacting some US-based government agencies. Uh, we have seen it impacting Argentina-based companies. We have seen it impacting some some universities, as, as I told you, California University. So so it's a, it has a pretty good footprint, and some of the companies have really paid them, like the University of California, uh, San Francisco, they, they paid them the ransom. Um, so, so how, I'll, I'll, I have explained how the networker works. Uh, just one more, a couple of more things. Uh, it is using a process hollowing or reflected, a reflected DLL loading technique. Actually, what it do is that the process that is created by this uh, VBS script actually injects itself in the explorer.exe, and this is how it executes. Uh, it creates an entry in the registry to get persistent, just in case you happen to restart the system when it is encrypting your files. Still, the system will come back, the entry would be retrieved from registry, and it would uh, 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 run again. Uh, uh, and if you see on the bottom of the right screen, you will see uh, that this. The, if, the, if you pay the bitcoins, if you pay the ransom, you will get a decryptor.zip and then decryptor.zip if you open you'll get a decrypt.exe and infoded text this decryptor is very specific to the victim so let's say there are two companies who get hacked or compromised this decryptor would only work for one company because as i said salsa 20 is a public key soft public key encryption uh, this this decryptor comes encrypted with the private key of the the given victim and then it will decrypt the files uh, and as I told you that uh, uh, if you see uh, the screenshot that I shared above, you will see that they have uh, shared the Bitcoin address as well. And if you do the cipher trace software, uh, you can find this on the McAfee ATR website and you do the cipher trace, you will see where this whole Bitcoin, because you can see this public information and you can see where the ledger, who, who has this ledger in uh, of uh, this Bitcoin address. So this is how it is working. Uh, quite a nifty tool, quite a nifty, a nifty attack. Uh, now let's talk what may have happened. So, so we talk about the malware, but what may have happened? So when I was talking to my buddies uh, in KE, uh, they told, so, so what I got is that they are still not sure whether it came through a phishing email whether a vulnerability was exploited or some domain credential was compromised. So, so they're still working on that. But the problem right now is that everything is encrypted. They were very heavily reliant on the Windows platform um, and everything on the Windows platform has been uh, encrypted. Uh, if you see the fifth point, uh, they do not have the DR as well. And the reason was because they had a real time 
a replication between prod and dr so anything that happened on the prod happened on the dr as well for the server side so so servers are gone when windows servers are gone windows hosts are gone uh, if you see the second point it appears that they have a misconfigured they have a, they had a firewall ng new generation next generation but apparently for some some business reasons uh, ids or ips was either not properly configured or was disabled just to make uh, uh, some sap traffic to go out and this is the first thing when the attacker comes in your ids never alerted you second thing they had inadequate uh, inadequate av versions on their server uh, they, they are using i guess trend micro and they were using trend micro endpoint on the servers as well that is not a very smart thing to do uh, because uh, endpoint server edition is of course built for the servers and endpoint uh, sorry trend micro server is built for the server side and trend micro endpoint is built on for the endpoints so you have to understand that whether it's good to have a security control but uh, is your security control adequate uh, so uh, because of these two controls misconfigured uh, one second because of these controls misconfigured uh, the attacker gets foothold into the system then the domain credential was compromised and some privilege escalation it was done uh, how it could have been done my guess is mimikads mimikads uh, or bloodhound these are the two very good tools that we often use in our red team exercises another problem they had a sim arc side but no sock monitoring really if you have a sim make sure that you tune it you have alerts on it and you have a 24 7 sock monitoring and somebody is really responding to the alerts and you are making constant efforts to uh, remove the false positives otherwise there is no no point of having a control unless you are really uh, really up to dating it or really tailoring it to your environment and one last thing <laughs> there is always a debate whoever is in it corporate sector people are always talking hey is still should we do offline backups are our tape archives is still a thing to do well yes because in ransomware if your uh, production goes compromised and it got replicated on dr well what else are you left with offline backups so so yes, and the problem with them was that uh, what I am told is that they didn't have the offline backups. And this makes the situation even more grimmer. The last slide I'll discuss, what could have stopped it? <laughs> well, you can give me a 1001 uh, suggestions that this could have stopped that, this could have stopped that. It's just not a ranting on them, but uh, and I tell you from my experience because I've done some consultancy, I see that this actually uh, is a case with very large Fortune 500 companies as well. Uh, and this is generally because of the shadow ITs. Yes, there is information security. Yes, there is a central IT. But just take a look around your environment or your company. You will see there are shadow ITs. And maybe a finance has a shadow IT. Maybe your production, oh, sorry, uh, your marketing has a shadow IT. Your treasury may have a shadow IT. Shadow IT, what shadow IT do is that they actually hides the whole IT thing the whole whole new IT tool, a whole new gateway from information security offices. So they do not actually know that there is something existing on some of our floor or some of our department. Uh, so what could have stopped it? Uh, I'm a very, very uh, staunch supporter, ardent supporter of defense in depth. Well, not me only, I think everyone, Brian Kerbs or everyone you talk, you, you, you see and there's your talks, they'll be talking about defense in depth. What is that? NIST, identif NIST says, identify, protect, detect, respond and recover. Like you shouldn't identify. There should be no shadow IT. And if there's a shadow IT, you should know what you have in your environment. Once you know what is in your environment, you have the inventory of it, you know what is the criticality of it, what is, what is the uh, severity of it, after that you start building controls to protect it. So you have a protection-based controls. All right, it's good to have protection-based controls, but we have seen that protection-based controls even fall, maybe because of a zero-day exploit, maybe because of a misconfiguration, or maybe because of a human error. What you do then? You should have a very, very 
a competent detection based controls that should be aided with the threat hunting you you should keep monitoring your environment uh, for all anomalies for all uh, 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 all, all activities that do not fa fall in line with the uh, threshold of any user or any system once you detect something is anomalous you should have responded it and you must have a uh, playbooks to respond ransomware, playbooks to respond phishing email, you should have play playbooks to respond any other malware, DOS, or any other attack. This is this is very important to have a response strategy ready, your incident handling strategy ready, reviewed, approved, and practiced over time. And then once you do that, you will be able to recover the data. Otherwise, you have very bleak chance of recovering your data. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, I cannot assert any more on the importance of sim alerting and SOC monitoring. This is a must to have in this environment and the kind of days we are having and the, and the speed with which threat landscape is evolving. This is a must to have and keep maturing it. C keep having a create a very clear RACI this like a responsibility, accountability, consultancy and uh, information chart so that people know who is responsible and accountable for what. Uh, this actually puts an onus on them and people are uh, becomes more vigilant. Maybe you are working with multiple third parties. So, so this is very important to have. Uh, so, so, uh, the, so, so the governance around it is also very important. Then uh, protection controls, yes, you have it, but tune them. Keep tuning them. If you introduce a new software in your environment, if you have opened a new gateway, if you have opened a new VPN, if you have connected yourself to another uh, Active Directory domain or just, 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 tune your protection controls. Do not think once the protection control is in place, it would be like that for ages. No, there's no golden image of that. You have to keep changing it to fit your fit your need. Periodic pen tests and wellness scans cannot, cannot read, cannot uh, uh, focus more on that. Like you have to keep playing this red team, blue team, or whatever you call it, purple team exercises so that you know what vulnerabilities you have in your environment. Uh, and once you find these vulnerabilities, go patch them. Um, and training, patch the human, uh, this is the most important thing. No matter how many controls you have in your environment, uh, humans are the chicken in this whole chain. They are the chink in the armor. If you do not properly train your users, uh, this, this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, and one good example is RSA attack that happened five, six years ago. RSA is a very, uh, very prominent security company that was later acquired by Dell. And if you remember, uh, so, so their security company, premier security company, it, government agencies use it. Uh, I love it. Everybody loves RSA products, right? And they got hacked. And how they got hacked? Because one of the uh, HR user, HR employee, yes, the HR employee who is not technical, happened to open an email that was uh, having a subject saying uh, that review your compensation or bonus. Well, yeah, exciting. Who do not open this email hastily? He opened it or she opened it. I do not know that who it was, but they opened it and got the whole environment at risk. So yes, patch the humans, do awareness trainings. You do awareness campaigns train them uh, and, 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 and keep doing phishing exercises. There are a lot of good products outside in the market that, that create uh, phishing exercises based on the environment. So like, like I, we just completed our corona-based uh, uh, phishing in our environment just to see how people are responding to it. And, and uh, in a couple of years after doing this exercise every quarter, I'm really seeing that our users are getting up to the game and we are seeing less and less number of people falling for those fishing things. So this is this is where I, I uh, end my presentation and I'll open the forum for the questions. Uh, I, I had to uh, run through a few slides uh, uh, in the interest of time, uh, but I really uh, thanks your patience and I hope you might have get something out of it. Uh, I'm always available if you guys want something. Um, any talk, any discussion, I would love to learn from you, would love to uh, share information and keep growing the uh, 
the mutual contribution towards this cybersecurity domain. Uh, I, I tell you, this is a very exciting domain. The people who are working here would vouch me for that. The people who are aiming to come into it, I tell you, it's a very, very exciting domain. It is here to stay. Uh, yeah, and do reach me out if you want. Uh, and thank you. Uh, I'll open the session forum for. Uh, I'll open the forum for questions. Uh, Sephora, uh, uh, would you take the questions? I do not know how would you take the question. Thank you. Yeah, I'm talking to my moderator to see if uh, we have any questions. Um, let me go to this page and see. Um, okay, I can see some people uh, talking and let me see if there's any question that uh, Well, Aisha said, patching humans or a professional. Well, both of them. Why, why not? Uh, patch the humans, patch professionals. Well, I am working in cybersecurity field, but I tell you, I'm equally susceptible, equally fallible to a good phishing campaign. Uh, 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 I remember one of, uh, it, it happened in 2012, there was a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who was in love with Porsche car and uh, he actually gave get a spear phishing email, or you call it veiling, uh, that actually had information about Porsche car, and and he got so excited, and he clicked the link, got the whole company had. Yeah, so patch everyone. Uh, so I'm getting how to. Uh, my my moderator is asking that somebody is asking. Uh, how to protect the data? Well, this is a whole new debate, how to protect the data. First, understand where your data is. Data has a whole life cycle. A data is can be in production or processing. A data can be residing in a database or on a disk. A data can be in the archives. A data can be in the form of reports. A data can be just lying uh, in the USB drives. First, follow where your data is. That's what I'm saying. Identify where your data is. You should know what all locations I have my data. Once you know all the locations, you can run discovery scans for that. There are multiple tools for that. Once you know where the data is, classify them. This is critical. This is non-critical. This is, this is uh, critical for the reputation of the company. This is critical for the going concern of the company. You should know that. Once you have... Uh, classified those data. You, you identified it, classified it. Now you know how much efforts you can put into uh, into securing the data and now how you secure it. You Maybe you encrypt them. Maybe you delete them if you do not need it anymore. Just delete it. Why you are carrying so much data if you do not need it? Uh, uh, and pro pro put protection controls. Okay, so so this is uh, and this is a whole whole debate. Uh, if you want to, to discuss on the data protection, either reach me out offline or I'd like to do a separate seminar webinar on that. Uh, uh, there is another question that says how to prevent from cyber attack and from of in form of mail, Abdul Tahoor. Ah, uh, in form of mail, I guess you are talking about email account, emails, phishing. So, so, okay, how, how, how you get hacked from your mail, emails, there are three things. Phishing, like you send, you create a message that says, hey, why don't you come and do your corona testing for free? And you send it out to 1,000 people or 10,000 people and just you fish them that maybe 10 of them would respond and you'll compromise their computer. One thing is spear phishing, where you target someone and say, all right, I'll create an email that is very specific to a particular company, very specific to a particular community, very specific to a particular age. And then you create it on the basis of their interests, their hobbies, what they like, what they don't like, what they do, what they don't do. And there, there's a third thing that is called veiling, where 
you actually identify a one high level professional, maybe an admin, maybe a CEO, maybe a CEO, and you create a email uh, and you fetch them. How you protect them? Uh, there are a lot of tools outside, like Proofpoint is one of them. You do your, uh, you put controls on your exchange that if if it feels there is some spam or phishing email, just discontinue it or just just block it or patch your human. Make awareness trainings. Keep doing phishing exercises so that they know that how well, how to respond or how to act if they get a phishing email. Patch them, make them aware, train them. Uh, wow, <laughs> uh, that's a good, very, very interesting question. My moderator has asked. Uh, the question is: Mohammed Faraz asked, "Can you discuss the political dimension of these syndicates?" I don't know if I can. I should. Um, this is my favorite topic. Uh, and do you have some ideological and moral principles based on which they choose certain targets and not attack their targets? Uh, well. For us, good question. Well, we have seen, so there are different type of attacks, right? Hacktivism. We have seen this on rise a couple of years ago when we see that people who, who, who uh, belong to a certain ideology, they uh, do attacks and then they call it that we are doing this compromise to do the hacktivism. They either target a certain company or a certain individual whom they think is not in interest of the a larger community or larger mass hacktivism. The other thing is a state-based hacking. Uh, state-based hacking is of course a very big problem. We have seen uh, North Korea being uh, uh, identified for being a state-based terrorist. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, China being uh, identified by US multiple times for uh, state-based terrorism, for uh, data breach, uh, so, so there is uh, there is uh, 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 this whole state-based thing going on, and how can somebody forget the the very, very, very famous Stuxnet, where U.S., China, uh, sorry, U.S. and Israel actually collaborated to create an Stuxnet malware that had Step Seven Simon server of the Iranian nuclear power plant, and actually shut down all the spindles, or actually change the frequency of the spindles and just compromise the whole nuclear power thing. How can I put a light on it? <laughs> I do not know if I should, uh, but yes, uh, this this is a very much a case. This is happening. And and hey, why don't you, uh, why, why do you forget about the Sony hack? Uh, this, this whole uh, North Korea was said to be involved because they were going to release a movie called The Interview that was based on their presidents and was mocking them. And actually, uh, North Korean president have made uh, claims that uh, we, we would take revenge. So yes, there is a political dimension, cut short it. Um, oh, OK, good one. How to detect malware attached with package softwares? Uh, I guess you are talking about Trojans, uh, because Trojans or hooks are something that you get a legitimate software or and, and they have some illegitimate piece attached to it. My answer would be to not do, download it from Torrent, to not download it from the websites that are not trusted. Have Windows Defender enabled on your web, on your on your system. Uh, make sure that whenever you download a, a, any software and before you execute it, uh, you you create a hash of it, MD5 SHA. Go on Virus Total. It's a very very good free resource and check if this. Uh, this this hash is identified as a malware or a malicious tool. Uh, maybe uh, upload it, it to some of the pay uh, to some of the free online service where you can get it evaluated. Because hey, if you are ignoring all the uh, all all the alerts that says you this is a malware and you still keep proceeding, nobody can help you. Uh, I'll take another question. Uh, <laughs> Anupra is saying, why Russia is so advanced in hacking? I don't know. They, they, I have a couple of Russian friends. They are too good in mathematics. I'm actually envy of them. Maybe because they are they're too good in mathematics, or maybe they, this is a parallel industry. Uh, I cannot comment on that. Really, that's that's beyond <laughs> beyond me. Uh, but yeah, they are they are good. Uh, actually, I remember I I went to one of the DEF cons where Microsoft was. 
uh, Microsoft was uh, 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 displaying their very brand new operating system. I won't take the name of the operating system. And in the very next session across the road, trust me, across the road, there was a session going on where Russian hackers were showing how to compromise this, that Windows operating system. No names, when it happened, where it happened, but it happened. Yes, they are good. Why they are good? I don't know, they're smart maybe. Um, well, Pradeep is asking Windows Defender is enough for, for dedicated malware, of course not. Of course not. That's what I said, defense in depth. You cannot rely on one single tool. No way, sir. But at least not on the Windows Defender. Um, okay. Um, Safura, can you message me and say if uh, we are good or any more questions? Uh, and is, is, is it a any trick to hack another Gmail account? Come on. No such questions here. Uh, do we have right data governance strategy to minimize uh, cyber risk? Well, data governance is a very important tool amongst other tools uh, to reduce the chances of getting compromised and if you get compromised, uh, reducing the impact. So of course, it's a very important tool. It's not, so, so data governance involves the governance side, like creating the policies, access control policies, who can access, who cannot access. And there's a technical side of it where you put restrictions or controls on the system. If somebody out of turn access some data, uh, you should get alerted. Or or if, if somebody tries to access your ACLs or uh, maybe um, the layer seven firewalls would block the access. So yes, data governance is definitely, definitely a very good and very important tool. It depends how mature data governance is. Oh, this is my cousin, Mohammed Faraz Siddiqui. <laughs> uh, thanks, for us for joining. Do you have a viewpoint on the broader encryption debate and whether end-to-end -end encryption should continue to grow and use despite criminals being able to utilize it for ransomware? Very, very good question. And um, Flomax should, how, how to answer that? That's a very smart question. And, and this is actually a debate that uh, yes, end-to-end -end encryption is very good, whether you use VPN, whether you use IPsec, whether you use PPTP, L2TP, whatever you talk. And they are very, uh, or use PGP, they are very good in protecting your data, but then there's a misuse of it, Tor. Tor is a very good uh, uh, VPN uh, solution that actually provides, kind of hides your whole data from law enforcement agencies. And it's very, uh, very actively used uh, 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 by by the cyber criminals. Uh, uh, for us, this is you you know that right. This is a very uh, very intense debate and and kind of uh, a thing where this whole cyber security community is divided. Um, I would say, hey, be just because something is being misused, you cannot discontinue using it for good purposes. Well. Everything got used for the nefarious purposes, but in general, uh, cyber, uh, this end-to-end -end encryption is definitely a thing that keeps you secure. Well, what if you just strip it out? Uh, well, then you are a sitting duck, right? So because then there, there will be no VPNs. How would your uh, remote sites connect to you? Uh, how would you send email? How would you do? How, how would your uh, financial uh, transactions look like? So. And that's a good debate, and I, I fall on the right side, or, or I don't know, left side of it, but I say, yeah, let's continue using it. Uh, again, Adil is asking which software is good to protect data from malware attack. There's no one tool, no, no names, uh, and I'm talking a platform agnostic. Uh, see what fits your need. I guess all the tools are equally good. Uh, just make sure that you know what you are protecting. Just know how your environment looks like, what the parameter and configuration of your environments are, and make sure that you have cut and tailored it to fit your need. Maybe uh, a tool configured for my environment may not be very good for you because you, your environment just looks like different. You may have uh, different technologies. You may have different ports open. You, have, you may have different tools working. So, so it, no one name. 
it's is you have to evaluate uh, different tools. Um, uh, okay. I, I, I don't know if I can keep going, Safura. Uh, tell me. Uh, uh, so, so if you can tell me how to discontinue, because I see some people are still talking about the attendance link. Uh, the session is around an hour now. How can we do a look? How to do? How can we do to look? Sometimes I can send an email from the name of the official company, and we do not know the spam email or something. Abdul Tahoor, exactly. This is what I have been advocating the whole day today. Phishing emails. Look, that's what I'm saying. It's not just a phishing email anymore. This is spear phishing email. It's a veiling. They are cutting it, tailoring it to your very, very need. They are making it so attractive to you that you are that it become irresistible to you. How you do it? Train your people. Aware your people. Let them grow through, go through the phishing email exercises so that they know uh, that they should not fall prey to anything that sounds interesting. And if trust me, if 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 you are getting a very interesting email about your favorite car or favorite uh, sports team on your uh, 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 corporate email, just just be aware of it. It it can be a phishing. Or if, if your HR is saying, hey, open this email and I'm discussing uh, your remuneration with you, just know that this is not the process of your HR. How you do that, train them, aware them, train them, aware them. And it's a constant cycle. Okay. Uh, I'm just checking with my moderator. Uh, 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 if I have to cut the cord or what should I do? Uh, give me a sec. All right, yeah, I'm waiting for the response. And uh, I, in the meantime, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, let me see if there is anything that I, sh uh, that, that I think uh, responding to it would be in the uh, interest of uh, all participants. All right, my, my moderator is saying that I should not keep going anymore. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, Sephora, just let me know if I just cut the cord or you, you have to do something else. And, and for everyone's advantage, just because I have a couple of minutes, I'll say there, is a, there are a couple of very good uh, online resources where you can go and uh, to start learning about cybersecurity if you are still in the beginning of uh, this, uh, if you are a beginner in this domain, uh, I would say thehackernews.com. It's a very subtle, easy website. They, they, they kind of make it in a storytelling way and you can keep yourself aware about the uh, ongoing cyber attacks. Uh, my favorite guy on uh, internet is, uh, uh, is Brian Kerbs. His website is Curbs on Security. I think he is one of the guys uh, who who write who wrote the best articles on cyber, any cyber attack. He 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 do very very great analysis and provides very good backgrounds. And I think he has intel from uh, underground forums as well. So so it's always very interesting to read his comments on anything. Uh, and another very good podcast on security is Security Now. Uh, I always tell people, that I think 60-70% of my knowledge, whatever I have uh, I have in the security domain, domain comes from Security Now, a very great uh, uh, podcast. If you do not have patience to read it, uh, to, to listen it to one hour, I think they, uh, uh, they, they do have their PDF scripts. You can read them. Uh, you, you can choose what, what interests you, and the guy 
do really good analysis. So these are some good starting points. Uh, I would say, yes, do them. Uh, because let's say, uh, there, there may be a lot of guys who work in the uh, carpet sector. You know, uh, there was once uh, the, this phrase used very much when people say, hey, marketing is not a job of the marketing people. We all are the marketing people. Whether you are IT, you are still marketing your company, right? Uh, especially if you work in startups, uh, or entrepreneur kind of uh, uh, organizations, this is what people say that, hey, everybody is our marketing guy. Everybody is marketing our product. Similarly, information security is not the responsibility of information security guys, not only the responsibility of your CISO or your security engineer or the firewall guy sitting there. Information security is the responsibility of everyone, whether you are working in HR, you are working in finance. Uh, just do not pick up a USB that you found in the uh, driveway or your parking lot. Just do not do that, please. So we all have to be cumulatively uh, mature our security controls and make sure that the good job your IT security guys are doing, you do not you do, do not uh, you do not uh, undermine them just because you were uh, not mindful of what to do and what not to do. And one last thing uh, I would like to share is uh, about the cybersecurity career, uh, because people are asking me about that. So just a quick note on that. Cybersecurity is not just about the very technical. There are layer one, layer two, layer three. Uh, there are layer one and layer two guys or level uh, to who are very technical. They write codes. Maybe they are doing scripting. They are uh, doing attacks. Uh, like, like they're doing red team and blue team. They may be running different kind of tools. But then there's a layer three as well. Uh, which is uh, CISO office. They are creating policies. Uh, they are risk management departments. There are IT audits. They're not very technical. So if you think that you want to come in a cybersecurity, it really excites you, but you do not have the required technical skills possessed, but you have the right mindset, you still can explore different domains in IT uh, in cybersecurity uh, domain. So on that note, uh, uh, I would thank again to everyone. Um, yeah, I'm still getting messages, but I, I think uh, this is the time to cut the cord. I, it has been over an hour. Um, I again uh, thank you guys really. Uh, thanks for the patience. I hope I contributed uh, something to you guys. I'll I'll share my email address here just in case anybody wants to uh, reach me out. Uh, I would be happy to help. I would be happy to listen. Uh, and yeah, let's keep securing our environments. On that note, uh, have a good day. Uh, good night, whatever. <laughs> so have a good one. Thank you.